diligence, used 15 times in 14 verses of the Bible. Diligence is making it well with my soul and mind so that it brings righteous joy and gladness to my being. Having hope in life is very difficult when the noise of pain is all around us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is the Quick Study Television Radio Program. Thank you for joining us today. And I hope you'll learn, as I have, a great deal from the book of Deuteronomy. You see, our reading assignment today is Deuteronomy chapter 28 through 30, and we are going to be focusing on one specific chapter where we talk about the strong life force that brings hope recorded in the Bible. This is a very interesting teaching. I hope you stay around for that. Corey is here with Bible Archaeology. Corey? Today, we are actually going to be taking a look at where the book of Deuteronomy came from, who wrote it, when did they write it, and how do we know? And Ryan here, Ryan, the science guy is here with uh, Mysteries of the Universe. Ryan? Well, over the past few Fridays, we got to sit down with Ph.D. chemist and biblical apologist Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Well, today I ask him why he is willing to debate men like Hugh Ross and Richard Dawkins. More on that later. All right. This is going to be a good one, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know? Yes. Do you know how the heavens and the earth were described to Israel in the curses on disobedience? That and more coming up. Stay there as we continue on Quick Study. Deuteronomy chapter 29, Moses refers back to the historical event of Sodom and Gomorrah as proof of what he's trying to say. So what that means is that Moses accepted Sodom and Gomorrah as an actual historical occurrence. So right now you and I are going to explore if he was right. The famously evil cities of Sodom and Gomorrah appear in Genesis 14 in a league of five cities of the plain around the Dead Sea. They are destroyed and rebuilt. Soon after, in Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah appear again, this time to be destroyed by God for their vile practices. Genesis 19 verse 24 says, the Lord rained burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah out of the sky. Until the mid-1900s, Sodom and Gomorrah were largely believed to be myth or legend. But today, excavations have changed the attitudes of many. Five ruined cities have been identified as the only inhabited towns in the southeast plain of the Dead Sea. They date to the third millennium BC, right in the days of Abraham. Two of these cities have earned momentum as potential sites of Sodom and Gomorrah. The site identified with Sodom was the largest of the cities, and it had 23-foot-thick stone walls. Excavated in 1965 and 75, massive amounts of ash, charcoal, and rubble show the site was violently destroyed by fire. The site identified with Gomorrah, called Numaria, is seven miles south of Sodom. Even before it was excavated, remnants of fiery destruction was seen in thick layers of charcoal protruding through the thousands of years of dirt. Numaria, as potential Gomorrah, experienced two destructions within 20 years, fitting the Bible's timeline of the War of the Plain and then a fiery destruction by God. Two male skeletons were even found buried in the charred remains of a collapsed tower. 
Evidence was found in a cemetery used by both cities. Above ground charnel houses were destroyed when something set their roofs on fire. The fiery destructions, time frames, and locations make it difficult not to at least consider these as Sodom and Gomorrah. It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible and they're all around us. Now Moses had spent so much time in the presence of God that he was keen to understand what he spoke and said on behalf of God's covenant, that it would last well beyond his own lifetime. He understood that. Moses was a wise guy and we would be wise too when we realize that the language of our God is one of covenant and he never takes his word lightly and neither should we. It is a wise guy who senses, is sensitized to the divine fact that when we proclaim God's word upon our families through prayer and study in this present generation, we are doing so that that would move beyond our lifetime. It is always good and wise to wash our families with the word of God often. Deuteronomy 29, 1 through 9. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he had made with them in Horeb. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land the great trials, which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and to half the tribe of Manasseh. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. Deuteronomy 29, verses 1 through 9. Not too long ago, there was a science fiction movie called Life Force, and it was all about uh, the study with science has figured out that, that even though all of the physical necessities are there to have a life or a body or an organism live, it doesn't live without some kind of mysterious force called life force, and nobody knows what to do about it. Even modern genetic scientists are curious about that energy that keeps a body going and that sort of thing, and that's why Mary Kelly wrote her book Frankenstein and all of that. She imagined that the life force was somehow energized by a lightning bolt. But today I want to talk to you about God's powerful life force written and encoded in His Word as we study in Deuteronomy chapter 29 near the end. Now as we focus on this, there are a few words that we can look at and then three study-wise points that we can gather some wisdom for living today in. So let's take a look at the scripture. We begin with Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 1 to 4. It's already been read, but let's read it again. These are the words of the covenant, which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in the, on the mountain of Horeb. That would be where the Ten Commandments was given. Verse 2. Now Moses called Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all of his servants into his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen and the signs of those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive 
and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. Now here's what's interesting and the first uh, study wise connection we can make. God's strong life is hard to see in times of great trials. The noise of pain can hide his great faithfulness. Now, beloved, the truth is that God has never left us. God has never forsaken us. But there are many times in your life and mine when we feel like he has. And so we do not see God's strong energy in his life and the life of a believer at times when it feels like we're struggling with great trials and great tribulation. But may I say to you, beloved, that great trials and tribulation do not dictate God's covenant. God is committed to His covenant regardless of how we feel. And so we must rise above that and understand that God said what He means and means what He says. But remember that pain is noisy. And that is why we pray in times of great pain, Lord, I want to be still and know that you are God. Now, there have been times in my life when I have not been well. And the pain of suffering or sickness has overtaken that. It, it becomes very hard, you know, to be still and know that the Lord is God. But it is in those times when God's grace always seems to help me. And so I encourage you today, God has not left you. God has not forsaken you if you're in a time of great pain. Moses continues in chapter 29 and verse 5. And I have led you, Moses said, 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out. Your sandals have not worn out on your feet. And you have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine of similar drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Meaning he provided them with manna and water from a rock. All the things necessary to live. Now that brings us to the second study wise point, which is this. God's strong life force in us is best seen in our personal history, not single events that we experience of victory. You know, it is one thing to have an, a victorious experience, but it is quite another to have a victorious life. Now, most people think that a victorious life is when you walk through life and you never have problems and everything that comes up, you just clobber it down with the right hand of God's judgment. And, but that's just not the way it is. Many times in life we get beat around because Satan, for a time, is in control of this world. And that's why Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But here we learn from this passage that God gives us everything we need. Now it may not be what we want, but it's everything we need to survive times of great difficulty. And that's what we learn. And that brings us then to the next passage I want to bring to your attention in 29 verse 7. I want to spend a little time on this one. And when you came to this place, Moses said, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. We took their land, and we gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites and the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Verse 9. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all you do. Notice here that Moses encourages the people before he is ready to depart and be with God by telling them a historical past, giving them a pattern, letting them see the trail which they went through, look back on that trail and see, what do we call it? the testimony of how God's faithfulness has been. So that brings us to our third study-wise point. God's strong life force and His power are truly revealed in times of great battle and confrontation, not in times of peace, or not in times of peace. When we come upon great confrontation, and we are ready, in this case, of course, uh, what's happening is they're getting ready to enter the promised land. And so Moses is trying to encourage them. They have a battle in front of them. What he does is he said, you have conflict. And God has shown himself strong in the midst of that conflict. Look back now and see how he gave you victory in that conflict so that you may be able to move forward and trust in God's character that he does not lie, cannot lie, and he's going to give you victory in the future. That's called a testimony. And so, beloved, uh, God's great strength and life force cannot be seen in times of partying and great wonderful times, but in times of great conflict and challenges in front of us, this is when we are going to see the true power and the true nature of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Well, in our reading assignment today, we have reached the end of the first five books of the Bible that are accredited traditionally and historically to Moses as the author and compiler. Um, it, it's called the Pentateuch as well, for standing for five, pent, the first five books of the Bible. So right now, what you and I are going to do is we're going to look at some of the arguments uh, used uh, to say that Moses did not or could not have written it, and we're going to look at arguments for the fact that Moses wrote and compiled compile these books. Take a look. If the Bible is what it claims to be, a collection of books recording the accurate history of the Hebrew people and their interactions with God and the world, then it is unquestionably the most unique book in human history. Due to this, it has come under direct scrutiny and attempts to explain away much of its surprising accuracy and miraculous survival throughout time have been made. One such attempt says that Moses was not and could not be the author of the first five books of the Bible, that these were written much later by several different people. Admittedly, it is an amazing thing to think about ancient Moses writing and then Israel preserving these books right up until today. But where do the facts lie? Could Moses have written them as the books themselves and all historical traditions claim? We find that Moses, trained with the elite of Egypt, would indeed have had extensive literary know-how, including the ability to read and write. So did Moses have time to compile such histories, 40 years living in the Sinai wilderness with his nation. As their leader, he would have access to all of their written family records and histories needed to construct Genesis. And importantly, Moses had motivation as the nation's leader to create for them a solid, tangible reminder of their identity and the laws of their God. Did Moses write the Pentateuch? We have no reason to doubt it. Quick Study Television offers the Quick Study Wise Guide. It is a print companion to this program. With daily commentary, the study wise notes, wise guides commentary, and much more. But we need your help to stay in production. When you support in any amount regularly, we can send you this beautiful monthly guide automatically every month. If you give online, you can also automatically download the guide when you give. To help us out and keep Quick Study strong in the month of February, please write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also support online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Thank you in advance. We need your help today. It's time for Mysteries of the Universe with Ryan Hembry. Ryan? Well, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati is one of the scientists for Creation Ministries International, and he's written numerous books and articles and has debated well-known men such as Hugh Ross and Richard Dawkins. Now, Richard Dawkins is the world's best-known atheist and evolutionist, while Hugh Ross believes in God, but also believes God used evolution as his method of creation. Ross also believes that science has the same authority as the Word of God and often uses the creation to interpret the Bible rather than using the Bible as an authority to interpret the creation. Well, in today's interview, Dr. Sarfati talks about his experiences in debating these two men. This is about debating. Now, first of all, I want to pref preface by saying I I'm, I'm not uh, into debate as, as a, a, uh, the primary thing for CMI, because if a church asks us to debate, we would like to point out that we are already the other side, because the, the, the congregations her hearing evolution from the media, from the schools, yeah, at least six days a week, they've got the evolutionary side. So why would the church want to give half of our time 
when they've already got six days a week already. Uh, and instead of realizing we are the other side that you will not get to hear most of the time, you are going to get the evolutionary side. You're never going to miss that out. So why uh, you, it's, it's redundant in one sense. If you have us, um, then you should get our side completely because you're going to get the other side. But when it comes to uh, debates with, with these guys, um, the point was uh, we had this huge atheistic con convention in Melbourne. That was uh, 2010, uh, which included people like Dawkins, the most outspoken evolutionists and atheists. And uh, we wanted to say, well, we have a different point of view, which the public should hear and uh, we'll um, challenge your best um, and we've got my book against Dawkins book let's see who can do the best they didn't want a bar of it you see uh, they're very happy with the media basically gives them a monopoly um, they don't like the challenges Dawkins doesn't want his stuff challenged by people who are knowledgeable and the thing about Dawkins he will go around um, halfway around the world to find some uh, person who doesn't pretend to be a science and try and trip him up in scientific areas and that's what he's done, find, find some sort of passer, find some sort of a leader of the conservative women's uh, movement who doesn't pretend to be a science and, and then try and trip her up in, in, in science. But he will run um, a mile to avoid any real um, opponent. And Hugh Ross is another person. You see, it's, uh, in 07, uh, the American Vision Conference, uh, they wanted to have a debate between me and Dr. Hugh Ross. And Dr. Ross refused to debate. He demanded that I write an apology for writing Refuting Compromise. He actually demanded an apology. Uh, but then they substituted someone else to debate him and said, and then on, on the stand, Ross even told the audience that, oh, this guy is the first creationist who's, who's not afraid to debate me. So he's quite prepared to lie to the audience uh, about creations being afraid when he had turned me down in a debate. So, so both Ross and Dawkins have not debated me, uh, but they'll, they'll try and make out that their case has no answer. They've only got an answer because they avoid anyone who's competent in answering. If you'd like to read Dr. Sarfati's work, you'll need to go to creation.com, and there you'll find lots of articles as well as books. And of course, uh, Hugh Ross is one of my friends as well as uh, Dr. Sarfati, and uh, they're both brilliant men. Uh, of course, I, I tend to agree with uh, Dr. Sarfati here, but a very interesting mm -hmm. dynamic indeed. And speaking of interesting dynamics, Corey yes. and Ryan, this is a t I'm not even sure how this question is worded. I'm not even sure what, what we mean here. Yeah, there hasn't been a lot of discussion in between. No. Because we are totally and completely. This is, this is a tough Ryan one. even, he didn't even want to play rock, paper. No, <laughs> no this he didn't. He's too hard. so intimidated no. by the whole All right, thing. well, here's the question. Do you know how the heavens and the earth were described to Israel in the curses on disobedience? Any ideas, any thoughts? Okay. Corey did mention something about them being a witness, mm -hmm. which is correct, but that's not what I'm looking for. So I feel like the key to this question, you said they, during the curses, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Hmm. Okay, so in other words, we've got these curses and the blessings happening on Mount Ebal and Mount right. Gerizim. And so the question is how they're described. In, in the curses on disobedience, how about if for the three of you, I read the blessings Go okay. for it. Well, yeah. We need okay. all the blessings Just we can get. Just on that section, and maybe that will jar your memory. Okay, so on the blessings, the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give you or to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. So I think the, did the way that it's... Trigger it did trigger I think so. The heavens are open, but the earth is closed. In other words, the earth will not bear its... Uh, Fruit. Right. Can well, you use words from that era that might describe something like that? Hmm. Perhaps metals. Perhaps the heavens will be like, like bronze. Oh, like oh. bronze. <laughs> like, like bronze. Like Very bronze. good. Oh. And the earth will be more. like. And the earth Are will be like. Are we still talking about metals? Iron. Oh, Corey's iron. Corey got it. Okay. Corey's <laughs> got it. exactly. The heavens will be bronze, and the earth will be iron. And of course, iron was used where strength was essential and became a symbol of hardness and strength. And bronze, of course, in, in those times uh, were used to make military equipment, musical equipments, the altar of bronze. Prisoners were bound in bronze fetters. And uh, bronze was also used to cover wooden gates. So not a good description no. of the heavens and the earth 
to those who would be in but, disobedience. Yeah, if they're in disobedience, that's not good to have uh, things closed up no. like bronze. Not good. At However, all. I love how he describes in uh, in the blessings, the Lord will open to you His good treasure, the heavens. From the heavens, yeah, and of course Proverbs tells us that He has stored up in the heavens wisdom for the righteous. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a deposit of righteousness, wisdom for, for the righteous in the heavens, and if we seek it, as we would silver and gold, if we're more interested in the wisdom of God than we are in our paycheck, then God says, I'll give it to you. It's going to be very interesting. Let's, let's pray now. More and more our modern society drifts towards impatience and our increasingly abbreviated lifestyles show it. It's easy for the believer in Jesus Christ to lose his perspective. That God's wisdom is at work in us when we slow down enough to consider the faithfulness of God through our personal history. The Bible calls that a testimony. It is good and wise to stop regularly from the human race and make a pit stop and consider the divine provision God makes for us. So today we pray, Lord, teach me to slow down enough in my life to see your daily miracles. As part of our commitment to go through the Bible in one year, we also are going through the book of Proverbs. Our reading in the Bible guide today is Proverbs chapter 10, verses 20 to 21. Here is one line of that. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is worth little. You know, that's an interesting proverb, isn't it? The Bible says that Jesus said that from the abundance of your heart does your mouth speak. In other words, what's inside of you will eventually come out. Well, we learned that a lot, but Jesus Christ said this, that every man needs a call of God upon his life and has one, but must take it. You see, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, what does that mean? It means that none of us are able to make ourselves any better. But Jesus Christ said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from yourselves. Rest from the burden of religion. Jesus promised us that if we came to him, he would literally change us from the inside out, and he would make us like he wants us to be. Come to Jesus Christ today and know your Savior. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study. Remember the Bible Discovery Seminary. You can learn and earn your Bible teaching certificate from there online at your own pace. To find out more, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on Bible Discovery Seminary.